Good afternoon, everybody. It's very nice to see you all here back after the summer break, and you're all very welcome. My name is Joyce O'Connor, and I chair the Digital Futures Group. And today we have a very interesting presentation by Dr. Barry Harvey on Industry 4.0, Digitalization and Life Science. And I think this area is, has, you know, really ca captures the imagination. I saw um, a headline, I'm sure, Barry, you saw it in, in the Irish Times a while ago, life science sectors requires a new manufacturing prescription, um, which uh, conjures up lots of things. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we're talking to Barry and, and reading a little about it, life science um, sector is a major sector in Ireland. There's over 30,000 30, people employed directly, another 30,000 indirectly, and there's been masses in, of investment over 10 billion over the last number of years. So it is a major sector um, th that we're looking at. But just as, say, if we look at retail globally, there's been major disruptions, say, by groups like Amazon, and if you look at transport like Uber. And I think, you know, Dr. Heavey now will explore how healthcare and life sciences are also at a tipping point where technology is uh, driving change. So I think this, this presentation today, I think, will open our eyes to change that's happening. There's, you know, a tipping point here. And we're really very lucky to have um, Barry uh, talk to us. Barry has a, a very distinguished career. He started as a geneticist with PhD in Vienna. He worked in uh, pharma and biotech companies, I think, in the UK and in Ireland, but then went to the IDA as a vice president president in um, techno marketing technology in North America, and then went to uh, head up life sciences in the IDA, and uh, particularly and um, headed up the global side of that. And then he left the IDA and went to Accenture. And I was very interested to hear, as, uh, as head of life sciences and running the global team there as well, I was very interested to hear that he started with one person two years ago, and there are now 200 people in Accenture working in that area, which is, you know, quite amazing. And did you say 10,000? Globally. Globally. Mm -hmm. So you can see how big that sector is. So we're very lucky, as I said, to have Barry to speak to us today, and we look forward to your presentation. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Joyce. <coughs> and thank you to everybody for, uh, for attending today, um, and, and to the organisers, to Joyce and Jill and Deirdre, for, for, uh, for, for, for welcoming me and to the, to the group we, we met earlier for, for interesting discussions. So, so yeah, I think today I'm, I'm really going to talk about um, a theme that, that uh, the IIEA expressed a strong interest in the topic of Industry 4.0, um, which is a, a, a buzzword. It's around digitisation in, in manufacturing and, and particularly how it's relevant to the life science sector, which is a sector that I'm, I'm very fond of. And I think I'll also try and talk about this in the context of the overall mega trends in the life science sector and, and why, why this digital trend in, in the manufacturing space specifically is so important. So, um, first of all, um, I'll show you some of the, the cool Accenture slides. So I, hopefully if this works, uh, we'll, um, we'll be able to give you some statistics on the technology trends in the industry at the moment. So yeah, this is just, a, again, a little bit of perspective from Accenture on, on what's happening in the broader technology world and how that's imp impacting on industry, on manufacturing. Um, so we talk about this, this perfect storm that manufacturers are, are faced with at the moment. Um, it's just this raft of change that's happening very quickly. So, so some of the key points are markets are, are you know, the expectations of markets are, are, are moving much faster than they were before. So the expectation that new products will be brought to market more quickly, that new waves of technology are, are, are coming faster and faster, that there's completely disruptive business models. Joyce touched on the Uberization of, of, of the transport industry and, and the, uh, the Airbnbization of the, of, the, um, of the hospitality sector. Um, and also the, the product that, that people are, are bringing to market is much more, um, you know, much more complex. So I was just thinking about this this morning and uh, I'm the youngest of a big family and, and my, my eldest brother back in the 70s was a bit of a, a, bit of a, a, a prototype of a yuppie and he had a, a little MG uh, sports car um, which was very impressive at the time, um, a convertible MG back in the 70s in Ireland. And then when he, he into the 80s, he became a proper yuppie and he bought himself a bigger car and, and the, 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 um, 
the MG had no technology at all. It basically was four wheels, a chassis, and a, and a, a felt top. But the, um, the, I think the Renault 25 that he had had buttons on the steering wheel that you could control the, 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 the volume. And he had a car, one of these big blocky car phones. But we take it for granted now that you know your your average car and you know will have you know sensors all over the place and rear cameras all over the place and cruise control, adaptive cruise control. It may not be a smart car, but it's damn near close to it. And the amount of technology that's embedded in those products is is, is really massive. But I'll give you an example in a, in a few minutes about how actually life science is trumping that level of, of complexity uh, quite significantly and in a much shorter sp space of time than than what happened over my my brother's uh, car buying life cycle. The, the workforce in, the, in these factories is going to have to change. We had a conversation about this this morning. You know, um, big old factories making large, you know, one product in large volumes with very little change over time is a thing of the past. And, and the workforce has, has uh, new expectations about what their employer will do for them. Um, we see it a lot in Accenture where we're kind of an ult the ultimate kind of liquid organization where people's roles are constantly changing. We have almost 500,000 people now in Accenture globally. The life, so half a million people in one company. Life science is only a tiny part of that. The Irish practice is a tiny part of it. The Irish life science practice is a tiny part of that. But we all have to work and network in this massive organization and be entrepreneurs in a, in a massive organization and avoid that organization becoming bureaucratic. Uh, and the economy is changing. So you know, there's things like you know, the digital platforms that are out there, different sectors of the economy are interfacing. We were talking earlier about healthcare interfacing with digital, tech inter interfacing with pharmaceuticals, and, and so on. So the, the old kind of rules of the economy don't seem to um, don't seem to necessarily stand anymore. Um, and then if you layer all of that on the changes in technology landscape, so these are actually this is an old slide. So these are way out of date. So this is you know the, there's been a, 119 exabytes of data that was in 2017. So it's there's it, probably triple that at this stage. We've you know, we've had more data collected in the last two years than in the history of mankind. And a lot of that is frivolous data. It's, it's you know, megapixel cameras that are posted on Instagram or whatever. Um, but, but a lot of it's quite important data that isn't really mined very effectively. Massive amounts of processing power, lots of devices collecting that data, like the, the sensors in your car, and, and huge spending on, on trying to make sense of all this data using artificial intelligence. And then this is just the, the, the waves of technology are getting, are getting faster and steeper. So the, the first line here, it's a little bit tricky for people to see, but uh, the first line here is the, is the adoption of mainframe computing. So you can see it started in the 50s and it kind of peaked not until like the mid 80s, so, so fully 35 years later. And then you're getting into um, you know, the, 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 the technology that's, that's more kind of um, uh, familiar to us today, like the iPhone, the adoption of the iPhone happening from, from, from the, the late 90s um, and, and just growing exponentially. And then a lot of new technology coming through much faster. Now, quantum computing is the new <laughs> artificial intelligence, uh, essentially. It's a new buzzword that you'll be hearing a lot about in, in, in future. But these waves of technology are becoming uh, faster and faster now. And if you layer that onto people's expectations, it becomes difficult to, to keep up. Um, So, so yeah, this is kind of nice, pretty slides and a lot of techno jargon about quantum computing and, and, and so on and so forth. But, but how is it really relevant to the sector? That I, I'm not a technical person. I don't have an IT background. I have a, a biochemistry background. And I, I joined Accenture because I think this is really exciting in the context of the sector that we have here in Ireland. Um, so, so why is Industry 4.0 important for life sciences? First of all, what is Industry 4? I, I assume people have some sense of this, but the idea is, just in case anyone's not clear, and if you, if you have questions, stop me, the, the first industrial revolution was steam-powered you know, um, uh, equipment in, 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 in England, uh, then electrification came along, then automation, and the fourth is based on, on, on really better, better data capture using devices, using sensors, uh, but more importantly, actually analyzing that data and surfacing insights from that data using more advanced algorithms. Also, better interaction with the human and the machine. So highly automated plants are great if you're making one product very efficiently with not much change. But if you're, if you're adapting to rapid changes in consumer expectations and consumer needs, that big old automated factory is actually a, can be a, a, a very difficult thing to deal with. Um, and, and this idea that if you have that better interaction between, you, you do need some automation, but you don't want to take humans out of the loop completely, that that, that human-machine interface um, enabled by Industry 4.0 technology can, can help companies adapt to the rapid change and requirement for hyper-personalization that we talked about in the last few slides. Um, and why is this 
relevant to life sciences as opposed to iPhone manufacturers? Um, well, I'll talk about the fact that new drugs are becoming vastly more complex. So keep in mind my brother's MG to Renault 25 kind of journey over about 20 years. Uh, they're not only more complex, but they're now emerging faster from R&D. So, so Tom O'Leary from, from ICON will talk about the fact that, you know, the old adage was it takes 12 years to get a drug from, from clinical trial start up to, to the end on average. I was at a conference recently and a guy from Roche was saying that they ha they're now measuring their, their timelines in days. So they've set a target for a thousand days from discovering a drug to having it on the market. It's still three years, but they're trying to emphasize to their older employees we're not talking years anymore, guys. We have to be ready in days. Um, and if you think about that, a more complex product that's coming at you quicker. If you're in a manufacturing site, that's kind of intimidating. Um, and because drugs are more personalized, now one factory making one drug is not a viable factory anymore. One factory has to make 20 drugs or 40 drugs or 1,000 drugs. And so it has to be able to gear up and gear down for different campaigns and batches of different products. And what's always important is that the, the regulators expect flawless supply. These companies are not making Happy Meal toys where they can accept, you know, one in a thousand Happy Meal toys doesn't work and the kid cries. You know, this is flawless supply, zero defect every time. Um, and the stakes are enormous. If, if, if you fail in that, you're shut down and your $20 billion franchise is gone. So how can Industry 4.0 help? Well, um, if you have a lot of complexity, you're going to have a lot of variability. If you have a lot of variability, you better try and understand that variability so you can control that variability. So you've got to capture a lot of, technology, of data on your variables. What's variable and what, what could be variable and what is varying, and how does one variable influence another variable? That's the basis for, for statistical analysis. So you need to capture more and more data, as we talked about earlier using IoT. You need to be able to do deep analysis and find correlations in that data to get to the root cause of your problem or take a proactive step to improve something. And, and you need to augment your human so they can be, have a human-machine interface. So the human will be trained quicker, they'll, be, they'll make less mistakes, they'll have more agility, they'll be able to adapt more quickly, do more things, and make better decisions faster. And, 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 uh, and ultimately, this industry is all about risk. You know, very often when you hear about Industry 4.0 and other industries, they emphasize the business case for investing in Industry 4, we will get 20% more efficient. We'll be able to push out 20% more widgets for the same cost. In pharma, they haven't really figured this out yet, but they really their business case is based on risk. It's like buying insurance against a major screw-up in your manufacturing facility. If you understand your variables, you understand what's happening, there's a lower chance you're going to have a, a screw-up that will shut you down. There's been, you know, the, there's been a couple of major cases of companies like Genzyme about 10 years ago, who lost control of their manufacturing. They were a darling of the, of, of the street because they brought some amazing drugs to market for patients with, with really bad diseases. They had brilliant R&D, but they lost control of their manufacturing and their share price collapsed. And Sanofi acquired them, and, and Sanofi has kind of turned them around and they've been a success, but the shareholders kind of got, got bitten by, by loss of control in manufacturing. Um, so this is the point around the products becoming um, more complex. So, okay, there's more sensors in a, in a, a Hyundai uh, i40 now than there is in, a, in, in, the, in the really sexy MG that was driving around in the 70s. But it's not this more complex. So this is the best-selling drug 10 years ago. It's called Lipitor. Um, and the chemical formula for Lipitor, and I don't want to get too technical here, but I, I like this way of explaining it. You need to string together three Cs, 35 Hs, an F, two N's and, a, and, a, and five O's. And that's how you make Lipitor, it's chemistry. But the best selling drug in the, uh, you know, at the moment is a drug called uh, Humira. So you can see, you gotta string together a lot more things to make the best selling drug 10 years on from the, so it's, it's a lot more complex than going from a Hyundai i40 to, for, from, a, from an MG. Um, sorry, I can't remember the name of the model that he drove. Um, and fundamentally what that means is a lot, can go, a lot more can go wrong when you're making that product, there's a lot more risk. Not to say it's easy to make those pro that product, it is actually, you need some pretty ninja chemistry to make that product, but once you've figured it out, the manufacturing process, it's highly, it's rinse and repeat, it's turn the handle. That's why um, when that drug went off patent in 2008, or sorry, it started to go off patent, I think around 2000, it goes off patent in different countries different times. I think around 2008, 9, 10, it was go starting to drift off patent. The generic companies piled in because it was easy for them to copy it. And that, the, the sales fell off a cliff and you heard about the patent cliff. That drug there is already off patent 
since 2017, and it's been growing continuously since then. It's still, it's still the best-selling drug, and it continues to grow because it's really hard to copy. But if it's really hard to copy, it's also really easy for the, the company themselves to screw up the manufacturing. So they need to be on top of their manufacturing or they lose their franchise. So if you have more complexity, you have, you have more comple in the product, you have more complexity in your processes and more complexity in showing um, the regulators that you're, you're in control. This is just the point, I'm not going to drain this, but this is just the point around the fact that um, things are moving more quickly. Um, this is just some, again, some data from the British Medi Medical Journal showing that in cancer in particular, and we talked about this br briefly, cancer is an area, because medical oncologists have been very uh, aggressive about adopting new drugs, seven, over 70% of, of cancer drugs have been fast-tracked through the uh, approval process in the last few years. So the FDA has said to the, to the industry, your drug is so exciting, we're going to give you, we're going to give you, speed you through the process, we're going to speed up, we're going to get our regulators working fast which, to get this to market because patients need this. And we're seeing that across a number of different disease areas. But a lot of cancer drugs are really complex, as you'll see in a minute, and so you have this double whammy effect. Um, this is the point about um, the, the whole area of low volume, high mix. So there's more and more, um, you used to hear about the blockbuster in, in pharma, and now it's all about the niche buster, that you, you focus on a much smaller patient population and you really cure that disease or get as near as damn close to, 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 to curing it. And you, you charge more for that drug in a smaller patient population because you're having a bigger impact on the patient outcome. And that was a kind of a mad idea back in the 90s. And Genzyme, the company I mentioned earlier, actually really went after that model and made a big success of it, and everyone copied them. But fortunately for Genzyme, they screwed up the manufacturing and they, they lost out. But that model now has come through, and, and most companies, most facilities here in Ireland and elsewhere have gone from one-product facilities to multi-product facilities with lots of complexity and changeovers and so on. And then we talked about this a little bit in, in, in the room downstairs, this idea of looking also beyond the drug. The drug itself is already quite complex, but very often you'll see a lot of Me Too drugs coming out. They're, they're slightly different, but they have maybe the same approach to treating a disease. And a big thing now is how do you differentiate your drug in the market? Add more complexity on top of, of, of making the drug itself and making it flawlessly every time, but wrap a device around it that, that makes it easier for you to inject yourself, that this is a an auto-injector that instead of having a needle and glass, it used to be the drugs that you have to inject yourself with, they're so complex to make, companies took the Henry Ford approach to it. You can have it in any format you want as long as it's in a glass vial, uh, and you have to inject yourself and figure that out. Whereas now, you know, there's so many companies have figured out how to, how to manage these, these biologics or have these in their pipeline, they're wrapping um, more, more uh, features, so to speak, around that, um, that product. And you can see here, it's a, a, an example of a an inhaler um, where it's measure, it's, it's obviously giving you your drug for your asthma or your, or your COPD, but it's also linked to an app that might be linking into the smog uh, or the weather or your Fitbit and saying, right, you've been doing a lot of exercise and you're, you're on a trip to, to Shanghai, <laughs> so you might need an extra dose of your, of your COPD medication, um, or you, you, you may not. And, and lots of interesting stuff happening in diabetes in this space as well. So here, you're, you're intentionally adding complexity to your drug. You're adding features, um, like you do in the automotive industry. But as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of unintentional complexity creeping in. It's not unintentional, but it's, it's unavoidable complexity because the biology now is becoming so complex. The companies have to make complex products and then intentionally add even more complexity. So I keep coming back to complexity in, 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 my, in, my, um, in my talk on this topic. Um, this is just... A, it's probably difficult to read, but this is just the kind of value chain in pharma. So, you know, companies focus on discovering a drug, putting it into clinical development, testing it in humans, getting regulatory approval, and then doing lots of interesting things in the marketing space, doing smart launches, providing solutions to patients, smart marketing solutions, insights-driven solution. This is kind of where a lot of Accenture's life science activity focuses. We're known for this globally with big pharma companies in helping them digitally transform this value chain. Um, but I don't focus on this at all, because underneath this, if you've, if you've got this going on, you also have an equivalent activity figuring out, discovering a drug, figuring out how to make it at small scale, large scale, for all of these to feed up into all of this value chain, and then launching the drug, and then maybe transferring it to a new facility in Ireland, hopefully, if, uh, if you've built a facility here or somewhere else maybe re-optimizing the process and, and maybe then um, uh, end of lifing it. 
And very often, um, this is kind of forgotten about because people still think, well, pharma has big margins, manufacturing is easy, you know, it's not that, but they forget that, that, that the manufacturing sector has been on this journey of complexity. So um, we often refer to the, what we call the, the kind of digital thread. There's lots of data being collected around here, often in silos, in different groups in pharma. So the R&D guys are understanding a bit about how the drug works, and the manufacturing guys are figuring out the different variants of the drug, but they might not think to join the dots between when we see this variant, or when we saw this variant 10 years ago during development, we might see it again when we tech transfer to a, tech, to a, to a CMO, uh, and, and there's no way of joining those dots. So we're, we're advocating for the idea that, that companies need to start breaking down the silos between their organizations, sharing data, and more importantly, sharing insights. Um, and this idea of the digital thread, connect the dots between data silos and better understand your product, your patient, but also the, the manufacturing processes that you, you have to bring those products to the patients. So as I mentioned, oncology is at the cutting edge of innovation. So I, I just look, this is a, a recent story in the Wall Street Journal of, of a new drug. It's, it's a little bit difficult to read. New cancer drugs offer the alternative to chemotherapy. So traditionally, you, you think of the kid in the hospital with getting chemo, the hair is gone, they're looking a bit pasty, they're not looking too well. This kid has been through an experimental clinical trial. She, was, she was, um, had a terminal cancer. Here's her dad giving her a dose of, of, of the drug and completely cured her cancer. She's, she's cancer free now and she didn't have any of the side effects because the cancer was highly targeted to her particular drug. Um, and what I love about this is, you can't read it here, but this is a, you know, a rock star medical oncologist in a, in a research center in, um, in New York coming in to check on her how she's doing six months after the trial is finished. So she's asking them to check out her hangnail. That's the biggest thing she's got worry, she's, that's worrying her at the moment is her hangnail. So the medical oncologist is giving her, is checking that out for her. Um, and then, uh, Oh, did I skip a slide there? No. Okay. So this is, again, shout out to Novartis. Um, so that's one example of, 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 um, of, um, of um, uh, innovation in, in oncology. This is a really cool one. This is a, a drug called Kimria, or treatment called Kimria, which is a hyper-personalized cancer treatment. And you hear a lot of buzzwords about personalized medicine. Oh, it's going to be, we're in the age of personalized medicine. And it's a bit of, a, it, it's a bit of an overused terminology. So we've We've tried to break away from it or, or, or be a bit more specific, and we say hyper-personalized because we're consultants and we come up with cool phrases like hyper-personalized. <laughs> um, but this is really like it's for you. It's not kind of a niche buster. It's not for a, a sub-population of patients with, you know, prostate cancer type 51629, which is like there's thousands of people with that type of prostate cancer. It's about literally your treatment for your cancer. Um, and this is done, done by, uh, came, came out of re uh, research from the University of Pennsylvania. Emily Whitehead, if anyone wants to just Google Emily Whitehead video on YouTube, it's really nice. She was in with the hospital with the hair gone. They tried everything else. She was end of, you know, this was end of line treatment. So she was ex enrolled in an experimental trial in 2012, which was run by a bunch of academics. Um, wasn't really, you know, a kind of a, a ph typical pharmaceutical uh, clinical trial. And essentially, uh, we've lost some of the slides here, but, but essentially what the process is, is they took Emily's cells out of her blood. So in your blood, you have immune cells, which I refer to them as the soldiers of your body, and they're supposed to pick up cancer, but usually they don't. And they took those cells to a factory, and they did some jiggery-pokery on them, which is genetically engineered their, her immune cells. And I describe it as like putting a pair of night vision goggles on a soldier and giving them a, a Kalashnikov and telling them, right now, you're going back to the front. You're going back you know, with, with your night vision goggles on. They inject the cells back into, into Emily, and, the, and the, the cells now will seek and destroy her um, cancer much more effectively than they would normally. And she was, she's completely cancer-free now. This is you know, um, eight years later, and she's, she's doing great. And there's really nice videos of her on, 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 on her parents who have become kind of campaigners for this. So that, this is kind of the process here. But effectively, at this stage, you're, t you're taking, yeah, this is your, your, your World War I soldier in the trenches, not, not getting very far, not doing much. You're turning him into a super soldier here, and you're putting you're putting them back into the patient to, to clear up the cancer. And this all happens uh, in a, essentially in a factory. So you're, you're combining a kind of a clinical treatment with a factory, and you're doing a batch for one person, and you better not. So this is the product. Um, this, is, this is Kimria. And if you look at the label, what's inside here, you, what you've got inside here is you've got human T cells, which is your immune cells. They've been cultured and genetically modified. They can only be used for the patient where they came from, that's autologous, they can't be used allogeneically. 
It contains about 2 million, but it could be up to um, 100 million or 200 million. So it's not quite sure how many are in there, but it's, so it's a pretty complex product. Uh, you have to store it at minus 120 degrees Celsius when you're transporting it. Um, and it's the label for this product coming out of the factory has the name of the patient, John Doe, in this case, and their date of birth, and so on. So you need to identify on the product, which is pretty, pretty amazing, right? Um, so continuing the theme of oncology, the, these drugs I'm going to talk about briefly now are not as, as fancy as Kimria, but they're actually making much more money than Kimria at the moment because Kimria is quite expensive. So uh, Merck brought out a drug for Keytruda, Forbes magazine recently. Uh, this is the other Merck, sorry, MSD. Um, launched in 2014, um, and it's at 7.2 7 billion, quite quick, so kind of hockey stick growth. So this, similar to the last one, but, but not requiring, so the, the injected drug into your, into your body that kind of activates the soldiers, and the soldiers go a bit crazy, and they, they, they kind of seek and destroy the cancer. Works very well, and BMS have a similar drug called Optivo, um, and that's heading towards their overall oncology franchise, heading towards 12, 11 billion um, by next year. So the implicate, now we're getting to the Irish implication. So as I mentioned earlier, we, in, when I was in IDA, I still say we, um, we went after these kind of companies and, and encouraged them to invest in Ireland. And they said, well, our new drugs are these complex biologic drugs. We need people who know how to make these. So we set up a training center to get them trained up to be able to make these drugs. And the net result was, when you have growth like this, you typically need a new factory, right? So they got ahead of it, and they're investing about half a billion in swords, and they're investing almost a billion out in, in, in uh, Blanchardstown. Um, and it's a, it's a massive jobs bonanza. But, but fundamentally, this is a whole new way of manufacturing, and this has been, there's been several other of these um, in recent years. Getting close to my time here now. I'm going to give you a brief what's Accenture doing in this space. I don't want to do this as an infomercial on Accenture. Um, it's more to show you how we're, how we're approaching it and why Ireland is, 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 is the Irish part of Accenture is reacting to this. So Accenture in the manufacturing supply chain space was typically focused just on playing up supply chain, optimizing your supply chain, not too focused on your detail of your manufacturing. So what we're doing now is we're trying to diverse, integrate diverse IT tools um, to go back into more detail in the business process where all this complexity is and curate the data better that from all these different silos and actually unleash then the, the insights, the digital thread. So we've, if you look at the business process, you, you decide you need to make drug, you buy all these raw materials from somewhere, you have to really check that they're, they're, they're consistent because if they're not, your product's going to be out of whack. Then you make them, you have to make sure your process is in control or their product's going to be out of whack. And then when your product comes out the door, you better make sure to the regulator that your 6,534 carbon atoms are all in the right spot every time. So there's a huge amount of data to be collected in this process that wasn't really as important before when the drugs were simpler. So we've um, acquired companies that spent, niche companies who were specialized. We bought a company called Lab Answer in the US that specialize in this data curation. And we bought an Irish company, ESP in Cork, that specialized in this data curation. And we also had a big data analytics group in Ireland here who used to work in the financial services sector doing analytics for, for the banks. And we've moved them all over to the pharma to say, there's lots of complexity here in pharma that needs, needs an analyzing. So they've moved from actuary into biotechnology. Um, so this is then the structure of our team now. So we now have 100 people in our, well, we, we had 100 people in already in our analytics team in Ireland uh, before I started, but a lot of those are pivoting towards life sciences now. Um, we have the, we made this acquisition in the US just when I joined and we, we managed, I kind of put my IDA hat on again and got them to set up their EU hub um, in, in Accenture Ireland, so they now have a 30-person team and that's growing rapidly. And we bought uh, ESP this year and that's a 100-person team down in, in, uh, in Cork, so we're well over 200 people. And then in addition, we're lucky that Accenture is actually headquartered in Ireland, so we have this big innovation center in, 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 in Dublin called The Dock that opened in 2017. It's about 250 people there working in innovation, not life science focused, but I've, I've, I'm getting them to, to, to work on a quite a few life science related activities and industry forward-related activities. So we have a nice kind of capability around this whole area that we're, we're building on. But what the point of this slide is, not as I say, I'm not trying to just talk about how great Accenture is. The point is, this is a symbol of how Accenture have kind of gone, wow, something interesting is happening in Ireland. We should be moving and buying companies in Ireland and doing interesting things in Ireland because the sector here is quite, is quite, um, it's quite fertile. And you know, they, I, when I was trying to make my case internally in Accenture, 
to do this, this is the kind of slide I'd show them, you know, nine top ten, the old IDA slides from, um, from my time there. Oops, sorry. Um, yeah, and a shout out to, to IDA and, and the relationships that they, and the support they give to multinationals and the, 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 the fact that, you know, it's not all about tax, the, 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 the science and engineering um, capability is really key. And the fact that IDA is invested in things like NIBERT for biotech and IMR for Industry 4.0 is really important. So I, I guess my point in, in this slide is really to make the point that it's Accenture now as a big or global organization, but operate like Industry 4.0 is seen as a kind of a German thing, like the Germans kind of patented the, 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 the point. But as Accenture would see Ireland as being ahead of Germany in Industry 4.0 in the pharma sector. Maybe not in automotive, but certainly in pharma. And we have a unique capability here, certainly way ahead of the UK. I mean, but you know, the UK again has a big manufacturing sector that's very loud and noisy. Um, but you know, when you actually see the level of innovation that's happening here in Ireland, that's much higher, uh, and the cluster of, of scale of capability that we have here. Um, so that's why Accenture is making these investments and, and, and so on. So that this is just, again, we talked about some of the investments earlier, but, but just a, a who's who of companies making major investments in, in, in the sector, like J&J, like &J, Donald Cork. I see a couple of people from J&J &J here as well. And, uh, and with that, that kind of brings me a little bit, a few minutes late, but to, to the end. Very well. Thank you very much. No problem at all.